Are you ready to just add water this morning? Water to the Word, or the water being the Word, amen. We're going to be talking about the Word this morning, just add water. Now, how did I, how did I come up with that? We're talking about the full gospel still, but uh, the Lord gave me this uh, as I was praying about the service, so just add water. Now, many times if you feel dehydrated, it's too late to drink water then. Many sports people know that you have to hydrate before you take, partake in the sports you have to make sure that there's enough water in the body. The water functions well in the body. Amen. You know that your body, when you're at birth, it's 70-something percent water in the body. It, it sort of deteriorates a little bit as you get older, apparently, into the 60 percenters. Amen. So our bodies are basically mainly made out of water. If you think about the human body, isn't that amazing how God designed us? And you know that they've done studies on water. And uh, that the, with water, that even there's effects on water when people speak. Even the same as it is over plants and other things, there's power in the words. They've taken, even put water onto words. There's one experiment that I watched onto YouTube, is they put water onto a word. For instance, the word creation. They took the word creation and they put a Petri dish with water in on that. And when they froze that water, there was a certain sign or symbol or hieroglyphic, whatever you want to call it, on that water. Every time it was the same symbol over the word creation. Isn't that powerful? What did God do? In the beginning, there was waters upon the earth. Amen. And He spoke. Amen. When He said there was light, the light came. You see, the waters re- re- respond to the Word. How many of you know this? The waters even in your body respond to that. Even when you're spoken over, something happens in your body because you're mainly made out of water. Isn't that powerful? I even saw another study. There's a lady in New Zealand, the enemies of Australia and the enemies of South Africa, if you're not an uh, All Black supporter, where's our All Black supporters again? Let me be reminded where my enemies are in the sta- stadium this morning. <laughs> Amen. Uh, oh, there we go, Morris. Oh, they all in one line this morning. You see, you are. Tra- <laughs> Amen. Uh, I-, I love the guys that support. If you support Italy or New Zealand or Australia, it doesn't. I see there's a guy in Australian colors here as well this morning. Amen. <laughs> Ivan, God bless you. But my, I'm always surrounded by my enemies. You know, there's New Zealanders this side and this side. Some of them don't want to put their hand up in case there's a fight that breaks out. Amen. But um, anyway, so in New Zealand, there's a lady that studied water. And she went to this place. And she said in New Zealand, the water, the pH of the water, the, the rainwater itself is seven point something already. Isn't that amazing? And she found this guy that would, had water that had, had a, a pH or alkalinity of nine point something. That's very high if you know anything about water. She was in an accident 20 years before that, and she had shrapnels of glass in her body that they couldn't remove. She started drinking this water, and this water started pushing those pieces of glass to the surface of her skin. She's 17 pieces she removed with a tweezer out of her arm and out of her jaw area. The water pushed that out. Now, this morning, I want to show to you that water is a purifying agent. Anywhere, if you have something that needs flushing in your body, any toxins, you need to drink more. The purer the water, the greater the process of purification. And even this morning, when the Word of God is applied, the Bible refers to the Word as water. How many of you know this? Even in Ephesians, when he says the husband must wash his wife with the waters of the Word. Amen. Isn't that powerful? That as you use the Word to wash your life, you become purified. The cleaner the water, and there's nothing cleaner than the Word of God. There's nothing more pure than the Word of God. You see, that's why we cannot water down, as they say, the Word of God, because it is already pure water. There's nothing you can add to it to make it better. When the Word of God stands, the Bible says that the Word will remain until the end. How many of you know this? The Word will remain until the end. There's nothing that this world can get greater uh, help from or purification from than the Word of God. And that's why the Christian must know the Word, live the Word, Act the Word. Amen. So people around you can begin to see the living Word through the church. Jesus Christ is the Word Himself. The Bible says in John 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God is the Word. He's not separate from the Bible. You can't take the Bible and say, but that's not what God's saying to us. We will find God in other measures. Do you know that people have been trying to find God in other places? They've been talking to angels, they've been reading tarot cards, they've been consulting mediums, they've been going to places to do things, rituals, to find out who is God. But I can tell you now, God is God, and He is the Word, He's the great I Am. There's only one God, and His name is Jesus. Amen. 
And so the Christian, when he lives out the pure waters of the word, people find refreshing from a true Christian. When someone comes in touch with a Christian that is full of the Word of God and full of the Spirit of God, they come in touch with God Himself through that Christian. Amen? When you shake their hand, when you smile at them, when you treat them with love, you see, love will overcome a multitude of sins, covers a multitude of sins. Amen? And so when people meet the true Christian that's full of the Word, full of the pure waters, they feel refreshed coming out of their presence. Isn't it true? How many of you have met a true Christian before? Look at the person next to you. <laughs> Amen. Are they that true Christian? Do you feel refreshed when you've spent some time with them? That is the sign of a true Christian because they're full of the Word of God. And let us go to our opening scripture this morning that's found in 1 Corinthians 15. You heard it over the past two weeks as well. The full gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By the gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for all our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas or Peter and then to the twelve. Amen? That is the full gospel. Which gospel were you saved by? Do you remember the time that you responded to the gospel message? The good news that Jesus loves you and that the Father sent His Son to die for you on a cross. That you don't have to die in your sins but that you can be forgiven. How many of you know no sin here is too big for Jesus to forgive? Do you believe that Jesus forgives murderers? Do you believe that the Father forgives rapists? Do you, forg do you believe that God forgives drug addicts? Prostitutes? Politicians? <laughs> yes, amen. <laughs> I just led you up to that one. Okay. Of course, God forgives every person. Amen. It's not the standard of the person that God's looking to. It's the standard that He set through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard. And God's standard is the Word of God. Amen. And the Word says that God wants to save sinners. Every sinner. Doesn't matter where they've been. Doesn't matter what you've done in your life. Your past is covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. If you come to Christ, He will forgive you. There's no sin too big to be forgiven this morning in this place. Tell the person next to you that I'm a sinner saved by grace. There's nothing that God cannot reach. There's no place that God cannot reach into the heart of a person. And I stood up this morning and I knew that this morning when I stand up here this morning that some of you feel unworthy of the grace of God. Some of you say, I don't believe that God really loves me. That is often what happens in our identity with God, that we don't believe that God will forgive the things I've done because the enemy is so good at reminding you of your past. The enemy is a person that will bring up your past over and over and over again because if he can trap you in your past, you will never walk into your future. Amen. And the future that God has prepared for you is one of forgiveness, one of love, one of peace. Amen. One of wholeness, one of a place where you have freedom, where you don't have to feel the condemnation of the past anymore. Because the devil has got a job to do, and if he's done a good job on you, you will feel condemned this morning. But if the Spirit is doing a good job this morning, you will already feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart about the things that God wants to take out of your life so that He can make you a son or a daughter of the Most High God. God is a father and he wants more sons and daughters to come and return back to him. That's why the Bible says he's given us the spirit or the ministry of reconciliation to bring people away from the devil and the, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Restoring the true purpose of man is to be a son or a daughter of the Most High God. 
That is what God has called us to, to be sons and daughters. This morning, if the devil has had you at the place where you've believed these lies, stop believing the lies of the enemy. The only way you can do that, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Begin to believe the word of God over the lie of the enemy. How many times have the enemy lied to you? And it's not something that just happens where he comes with a straight out lie. It's a small thing. It's maybe something that happened to you even where you were not in control of that circumstance. Some of you struggle to forgive. The remedy is to come to Christ and know the forgiveness that he can give. And when you fully understand how much you've been forgiven from, you will understand how to forgive other people. If you fully understand how much God loves you, you'll be able to love other people. If you fully understand the nature of God, you'll begin to portray the nature of God to other people. How many of you lack peace in these days? The reason why you lack peace is because you only watch the news and you only read the newspaper and you only listen to the neighbors and you only listen to that one guy that keeps complaining in your ear or that one family member that's always downing things and always see the dark clouds instead of the silver lining around the cloud, amen, or see the blue skies around the one cloud that's in the sky. Have you met people like that before? People that look in the sky and it's going to be a blue day, but they say, oh, but there is a cloud coming over that hill. And you go, but there's 90% blue sky, je wilt. How do you see the volkie daar so in die verte? How do you see that cloud, that darkness? How do you get people that can still focus on that? Because the Spirit of God is not inside of them. And maybe the enemy has been attacking them and they're down. They need other Christians to come around them to encourage them. That's the purpose of the church. Have you been saved by this gospel? Totally transformed. You can go to the next slide for me. Transformed by the gospel. Our lives are totally transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We begin our new life in Christ Jesus by, by it, continue to walk by it daily and persevere by it into eternity. This gospel that was described by Paul says to us that Christ died for our sins. How many of you are fully convinced that Christ died for your sin? Every sin, past, present, and future sins. Christ paid for every sin that will ever be committed. Christ paid the full price. How many of you have broken the law before? How many of you are fast drivers here? You've got some tickets outstanding. I know as I'm standing here, without a shadow of a doubt, some of you have some tickets outstanding that came to you and you said, oh, well, they won't know about it, you know. See how long I can get away. You've broken the law. What if someone came to your door one day and said, Sir, you've been breaking the law for 20 years now. We've been following up on these fines that you have. It is now 100,000 rand that you owe the, the traffic department. Whew! I think my heart will drop and I'll fall dead down on the floor there, right there in front of them. But then, as you go to the traffic department and you're sitting down and they, they're giving you the evidence of your sins, devil, that you were guilty, you're fast, and you're a slow driver. I say, Good. Jonathan is more of a fast driver. Devil is more of a careful driver. But if you've driven with Jonathan before, he will spin into the churchyard. Pop, 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 stones going everywhere. Amen. Those are the people that break the law. Amen. <laughs> and if you're in a hurry like me, often I'll be speeding. Okay, I break the law daily. So, but when you sit down with that traffic officer and he says, yes, fine, number one, you got it in January in 2012. Yes, fine, number two, you got it in February 2014. Yes, all the fines and all, all the evidence in front of you. Are you guilty? What are you going to say? I'm guilty. Sorry, officer. Well, sorry for you. You have to either pay this fine or go to jail. 100,000 right now. Pull it out. You're Pocket there, if you got the check, there's no more checks to be written out. Eh? Banks don't accept them anymore. But then the gentleman walks in, a guy that you don't know, but a guy that says, Don't worry about Diervold, he's guilty, but I'm going to pay a hundred thousand on his behalf and he can go free from this fine. He was guilty, he should be sitting in prison, he should be paying the price. He is a naughty boy, but we will pay this fine for him. And there, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That Jesus comes in and he does the same. You look at your sin account. You've been guilty since birth. Amen. When you came into this world, born into sin, and your sin account was counted up against you. But Jesus comes and he says, I don't, I don't care what you've done. 
but I want to pay the full price. I want to cover that sin. I want to pay the price on the cross. And Father's love sends His Son Jesus so that you can go free from the sins. But you need to admit, amen, repent. And so I'm not going to be a speeder anymore. I'm not going to be a naughty boy anymore. I'm not going to break the law anymore. I want to turn now and I want to become a law-abiding citizen according to the Word of God. I'm going to live according to His Word. And now you have a new life in Christ. Amen. If you turn, repent from your sins and turn to what Christ has done, you are fully forgiven. I want to say to you this morning, there's no doubt in my mind that you can be fully forgiven this morning. 100%. God forgives you 100%. Not 50, not half your sins, not just the big ones, but even the small ones. God forgives them by His blood. Amen. He was buried and raised on the third day. Isn't this powerful that God has power over death? We say it at every funeral. That even though a person dies in Christ, they also live in Christ. Amen. Even though they die upon this earth with this tent that they're carrying around, they go over to a better place because they be with Christ. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. Paul writes, amen. And so I want to be in that place. Christ overcame death and he's alive right now. How many of you know that Jesus is not dead? Jesus is not one of the other gods that people pray to. Did you know that the Buddha, interest sake, what did Buddha die from? Eating mushrooms. Do you know that? He ate poisonous mushrooms by accident. And he died. You see, if he was God, no God, if he was God, he would have known that the mushrooms were poisonous. Amen? He's just a mere human being. And those that worship animal gods... Why would we worship things that were created by the Creator? Amen. You see, all of these gods, there are so many things that we can see that make common sense why we serve the only living God and His name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, our God. Amen. That we can call upon a sympathetic high priest. How many of you know that Jesus faced every temptation that you would face? That's what the Bible says. He has faced every temptation. You're not alone. That's why he's called a sympathetic high priest. In other words, he sympathizes with your, what you're going through. Amen. He knows what it's like to be tempted. Come on, ask the person next to you, have you been tempted? The answer should be yes. If they say no, they're a liar. All the time, some of you are saying, I was tempted this morning to kick the dog, slap the neighbor, cut the tires of the taxi in front of me. <laughs> I get tempted all the time. Amen. Temptation is a guarantee. What you do with it is what will either bring life or death. And if you're in Christ and the Spirit of God lives inside of you, Dave, you have the ability to say, no. You have the ability. God has given you the God ability to say no to that temptation. Remember Jesus in the desert, Galen? Those desert areas of Australia, the outback. Big desert areas. If you're in that desert area and the devil comes to tempt you, all you have to know is what does the Word of God say? And you can counter the devil. When the devil brings something against you, and he will bring something, it's a guarantee. He shoots fiery darts all the time, Ezekiel, and you lift up your Shield of faith, which is not based on your ability, but on what the Word of God says. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the Word. So all you need to do is just add water. Just add some more water in your life. Add some more Word in your life. If you're struggling in an area, go and see what the Word of God says. Meditate upon it. Make it part of who you are. Understand what it says. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Do you know that, Mandy? He will teach you the Word of God. He will teach you what the deeper meanings of what Father God wants to say to you intimately. And then you can overcome the enemy because he's going to come against you and you're going to say, uh-uh, devil, I've written, I've, re I've read in the Word something. I'm going to tell you what it says today because you know the devil already knows what it says, but you're reminding him of what it says. And then he will eventually vacate the premises. Amen. We get the devil out. He is like an illegal person that's staying in your house that you're renting out that haven't paid rent for a long time. It is time that you evict the devil out of that mindset, out of those thoughts, out of that lifestyle. It's time that you get rid of the devil. He's not welcome here anymore.
You see, sometimes we welcome the devil into our life, and he comes in many forms. But I want to say to you, just add the waters of the word. I'm going to take you to a portion of scripture that the Lord reminded me of in John 13, verse 5 to 11. And we're going to read it together in the illustrations on my left hand side of the washing of feet. Don't worry, I'm not going to call up a volunteer to wash your feet this morning. Because people go like, I hope he doesn't call me up. My socks have got holes in them. <laughs> Amen. You know that feeling when someone says we're going to wash feet? <laughs> Some people say, oh, I hate touching feet. You know, we've got all these things, all these reactions. <laughs> but yeah, in John 13, verse 5 to 11, just add water. You know what, when the Lord spoke to me in the kitchen about this is, I thought about this, if there's many impurities in my body, I need to add a bit more water to flush it out. To flush it out. If you add the waters of the word, it will flush out the things that you're thinking about wrongly. Because you need to renew the mind. If you're acting out wrongly, you need to meditate on the word so that it can flush out your actions eventually. Amen. So that you begin to meditate on it, that it goes into the heart, that it can come out in your actions. So that you can begin to act like the one that's living according to the word. Listen to what, what happened here in John 13 verse 5 to 11. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, you are washing my feet? A question mark. You are washing my feet? In other words, no. Jesus answered and said to him, What am I doing? What I am doing to you, you do not understand now, but you will after this. Let's just go further. Is there another? Yeah. Let's stop there for a minute. Go back to that. So I want to show you this morning. So this, here the disciples are sitting. Mics and water don't mix, eh? <laughs> Jesus is teaching them something. There's symbolism in the story. And this is what I love about the Word of God. There's deeper symbolism from this. And he comes in and he says, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter asks that question, my feet, Jesus. And he begins to pour the beautiful waters in there. How many of you are getting thirsty? How many of you need the toilet? <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay. Waters. Beautiful water. This is the washing of the word coming to you this morning. That as you receive what Christ has for you, the waters begin to wash you. What happens with your life is, and I'm going to make a distinction between what happens here, and I'm going to read this again. After that, he poured the water into a basin, just like I did. He began to wash the disciples' feet, and then he wiped them with the towel. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the towel now as well, which he was girded with like a belt around here. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said this, Lord, you are washing my feet this morning. I want to say to you this morning, maybe you're like Peter. You see the flesh is like this. Sometimes the flesh is a bit on the mule side, and other times it's more on the horse side, the stallion side. Sometimes it's saying, no, Lord, how can you wash my feet? Peter's in the flesh completely here because he's not understanding what Jesus wants to do. And you're going to see what Peter says just now. But let's listen to what the Word of God says. Then he washed their feet. You see, this is the thing that happens. You and I, this is not talking about being saved. This is not talking about being born again. This is talking about the washing of the Word that you need daily. This is your daily reading with God that is necessary. Because where your feet goes, you're going to pick up dust. Your feet are going to get dirty, amen. This is what the symbolism of this is. You're going to go into this world as a Christian, and you're going to pick up dirt sometimes. You're going to pick up stuff that's not good for you, stuff that will destroy you, stuff that will cling onto you, because dirt, once it gets onto you, it doesn't let go. It's fine. It comes in. It might not just be an open sin. It might be a mindset. It might be that you're mixing with the people that are teaching the wrong stuff. It might be stuff that's creeping in finely into your life, and eventually you believe the wrong things. That is what happens. You get dirty from the world because you're in the world, but not of the world. Amen. I want to show you something else. So he washes their feet. But what does Jesus do after their feet is washed? The feet now wet. It says he wipes it with the towel. He wipes their feet dry with the towel. Man, what a process. I wish I was there to see Jesus doing this to the disciples. Do you know this word? Let's look at what Isaiah says in the next slide. I want to talk about the towel quickly here. 
Isaiah says, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. Amen. Now, I want to tell you that this morning, that word towel in the Greek there is the word that refers to linen. And the word linen is referred to in the Bible as righteousness. Amen. And so Jesus was showing something here through the towel that was around his loins, girded his loins, that that word, the towel, was mentioned as righteousness. And he was wiping them in his righteousness. Amen. He was cleansing them through his righteousness. You cannot stand in your own righteousness. You cannot make yourself righteous. You need the blood of Christ to wash you. You need Jesus to come and make you clean. Amen. And of the things of this world, once you've become to the place of the cross, let's take the blood. Now the blood washes you of your sins, but now you pick things up in the world. Now you need continually to come to the washing of the word so that you can stay clean. This is the process of being cleansed by the Word, amen? Being cleansed by God's Word daily. This is the process of meditation on the Word. This is the process of sanctification by the Word of God, amen? And you and I need to come to that Word. If there's something that's bothering in your life right now, get into the Word, and the Word's going to cleanse you. It's going to lead you. It's going to wipe you clean again, and you can walk out into the world doing the things that God has called you to do without condemnation, because let me tell you why we don't go with confidence is because the enemy reminds us of our sin every day. And then we remind the enemy of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we remind the enemy of the empty tomb. And we remind the enemy of his future. Amen. His future is the pit of hell. His future is the fires of hell. Amen. And so it says, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Isn't that beautiful? Let's move on to the second part of John chapter 13. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. You see what I said about the flesh? Sometimes the flesh is slow like the mule. He says, no, Lord, you can't wash me. Now he says, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus. Now he's ahead again. Jesus answered him, if, you do not wash, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Do you see he doesn't say in me? He uses the word with me. You see, when the blood washes you, you are in Christ. When you are washed by the words daily, you are with Christ. Amen. You see the difference here. You are not only in Christ, but you stay in step with the Spirit by being with Jesus every day in the Word, walking daily. That's why it's called the daily bread. Amen. When you read that daily bread, you're staying in step. You must stay with Christ. That's why he said, you are staying with me now, Peter, if I don't wash your feet. You can't stay with me anymore. If you want to stay with Jesus, in step with Jesus, and doing what the Spirit is doing, read the Word daily and apply what the Word of God says. Stay with me. Amen. And then he says, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Amen. He still didn't understand what Jesus was trying to do here. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to, be, to wash his feet but he's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew they would be, who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. Listen to the difference here. The word bath there refers to being saved. Amen. But the word being washed here, or completely clean if you're being bathed, and you are clean, but you are, not all of you are clean. So there's the, the precious blood of Jesus again, showing us that you're born again from the blood. And he says, not all of you are clean here. Who was he referring to? Judas, the one that would betray him. You see, Judas wasn't clean. He was unclean. Amen. And he referred to him that. So let us be washed by the blood, receiving the right gospel from Christ, paying the price on, this, on the cross of Calvary, going from that place, knowing that we have eternal life in Christ now through His resurrection. Amen. And then we go also daily into the washing of the Word. Won't you look at it that? When you go into reading your Word again, think about this illustration. We're washing in the Word. We're washing away the stuff that is not in place in our life. If there's something out of place, let the Word wash you this morning. Here's a saying for you from Caroline now, Roji, she says, God's word is a living water that detoxifies our soul. The more we drink of it, the more it cleanses, refreshes, and renews us. Drink the word daily. Someone should put 
a scripture on a t-shirt like that. Detoxed by the word. Amen. Come on. And you can put a scripture to that. There's a good business idea for free from the pulpit. Amen. You will never thirst again. How many of you know that when the Spirit begins to live inside of you, what did Jesus say? Went to that woman at the well. When you drink from this water, you will never thirst again. He also said it in the temple in John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. On the last day, next slide. On the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart, or belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those who believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. You see, when you receive what God gives us in the Word, you'll receive the Spirit of God. How many of you long to be filled up with the Spirit again, till overflowing? How many of you are a little bit dry this morning? How many of you are a little bit desperate this morning? How many of you are saying, I need more of Jesus in my life? It's time that we open up to God this morning, that His Spirit can come in and fill us and cleanse us and move us into the direction that God desires for us. 